when we look at the gospel genealogies and even compare the genealogies of First Chronicles and Ezra, many atheists such as Richard Dawkins will write books and use these so-called discrepancies to attempt to disprove the Bible and draw people away from the truth. When in fact the authors of the Bible can be using creative language, numerology, playing on the Hebraic language and names to all get you as the reader to understand that you must look towards the Messiah. And here's just a few quick examples to emphasize that point. In Luke's genealogy, um, we read that there's 77 generations from Adam to Yeshua, Yeshua being the 77th generation. And what's curious about this is that Enoch was the seventh generation um, after Adam. Abraham and David was also born on a multiple of seven from Adam. Now, Yeshua is also born on a multiple of seven, which is 77. Although he is the ultimate seven, and we know what that is. It's referencing forgiveness. Remember, forgive your brother seven, seven times seven and then also we have the rest the sabbath in there so there's there's more going on than just the database here's another example matthew's genealogy can be is a little bit different it can be broken down into six groups of sevens from abraham to yeshua yeshua in this instance is going into the group of seven so this might seem quite technical but i'm just displaying this on the screen to make a point um, because the genealogies are filled with the signature of God. If we read them in English, which is what we've ended up with, with the King James, one may notice a slight problem with Joseph's lineage. Joseph, we're speaking of Joseph, um, Yeshua's father by adoption. Matthew states that Joseph's father is Jacob. Okay, we read that in Matthew. There's only two gospel accounts that record the genealogies. Now, Luke's record states that Joseph's father is Eli. So we have in Matthew, Jacob, the father of Joseph, but also in Luke, Eli, the father of Joseph. And furthermore, they have a complete different lineage compared to each other. So it couldn't have been like a spelling mistake. They both have completely opposite lineages. So how can we reconcile this? How can the two genealogies be reconciled? Scholars for 2,000 years have attempted to make this happen, so I'm not going to sit here and say I've got a definitive answer today. In the Torah Observant Movement, it is usually concluded that Matthew's genealogy is Mary's, not Joseph's, as the original Greek can be read differently, among other reasons supporting this claim. And this was made popular, as many of you may know, um, by Michael Rood. So here we see that um, Matthew's genealogy is Mary's and Luke's genealogy is Joseph's. That's how we can reconcile the two genealogies being different. However, another esteemed teacher, Chuck Misler, has a different approach. He says, no, it's the other way around. Matthew is Joseph's genealogy, but Luke's record is Mary's genealogy. <laughs> because of the original Greek and among other reasons. So he says it's the completely the other way. So what's going on here? Today, I wanna to present a system that I believe works if you wanna read it without bending the Greek language. And as the scripture states in the KJV, uh, Matthew and Luke's genealogy are both Joseph's lineage, not Mary's. Am I saying that this is definitive? No. And in the Gospel Studies mid midweek, I presented another point of view, which was um, the reason of Matthew's genealogy being Mary's. And I'm here today to show you a different angle and that I'm willing to be flexible on these issues that aren't salvation. You know, we get a very stark warning in Scripture that we shouldn't make issues that aren't about salvation divisive. Um, so today... Um, we're going to look at that and try and reconcile it using our Torah portion. And for those who are a bit more studious in this matter, in the room and online, I'm aware of the other concerns and the genealogies of um, the three kings of Jeconiah, oh, sorry, the, the curse of Jeconiah, the three missing kings, 
and um, we also have the 14 genealogies from exile in babylon to yeshua's birth i have my own opinions on how to reconcile these matters however my goal today is not going to be to cover them but to highlight something that could be quite beautiful and applicable to our walk so just a disclaimer beforehand titus 3 9 but avoid foolish controversies genealogies arguments and quarrels about the law because they are pointless and worthless reject the device of man after a first and second admonition knowing that such a man is corrupt and sinning being self-condemned we are warned in scripture that this topic should never be a decisive issue between us genealogies are recorded in the bible for our benefit so let's break this down without it being a contentious matter we see on the screen on the um, left uh, matthew's record uh, with being joseph's lineage and on the right luke's record also being joseph's lineage I believe this can be reconciled with what we've just read in the Parsha, known as a Levite marriage. Let's, let's see how this can play out. So what we'll first notice in the two records is that David, it goes David, then Solomon in Matthew's record. But in Luke's record, it goes David, then Nathan. So instantly we have two different um, separations in the family tree. Now, as we get down the genealogy, Matan is from the Sol Solomonic lineage. As we go down, there's loads of genealogies in between. We get to Eleazar, then we get to Matan, who was from the Solomonic lineage. And again, if we carry down from Luke's record, loads of genealogies in between, and we get Matat, who was from the Nathanic lineage, okay? Now, Matan marries... Um, Matan marries and Matan's wife gives birth to Jacob, okay? So Matan marries, um, the offspring from his wife is, is, a, is a guy called Jacob who we can track in the genealogies. But unfortunately, Matan dies after Jacob's birth. So what does Matan's wife do? Matan's wife becomes a widow, but marrying Matat. Now Matan's widow, now Matat's wife, gives birth to Eli, okay? So we have Jacob and Eli now. Jacob and Eli are brothers and they grow up in the same household, having the same mother, but different fathers. Now, Eli married, but before he had a child, Eli dies, leaving his wife a childless widow. So what happens? Jacob, Eli's brother, redeems Eli with his wife by marrying her and gave her a child according to Deuteronomy. So how can we reconcile these two genealogies? Well, this is what we're reading in the Torah portion. This is a way of how if, if um, the brother died, that lineage will carry on. Jacob and Eli's widow give birth to Joseph, who's Yeshua's father. Joseph married Mary. Mary conceived Yeshua by the Holy Spirit. Now, Joseph's blood lineage is Solomonic due to Matan. But Joseph's legal lineage is Nathanic due to Matat. Now, we read in Scripture of how Yeshua is Joseph's father. Now, Joseph adopts Yeshua, making Yeshua's family tree Solomonic due to Matan. Why is this important? Why is it important that his lineage is Solomonic? First Chronicles, we read, But a son will be born to you who will be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side, for his name will be Solomon. And I will grant to Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is one who will build a house for my name, he will be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So we see there a hint of that it has to come from the Solomonic line forever. So where does the Nathanic line come into this when we get to Yeshua? What's the spiritual connection? Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Listen how prophetic this is. Then I will pour out the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer, and they will look on me, the one they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, 
and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Who is that? The one they have pierced, the Yeshua, Yeshua's. And on that day, wailing in Jerusalem will be, a great, will be as great as the wailing of Hadad and Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each clan on its own, the clan of the house of David and their wives. And notice this, the first clan that's mentioned, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. So we see a connection between the Solomonic line, but then also the Nathanic line, both coming from the house of David. Yeshua's most famous title was Son of David. So it's, it's fascinating really, because we read in the Torah portion all these years ago of this Levite marriage, and we're thinking, how can this even be, be useful? And we're seeing it being used in the Messianic line. And we, this isn't the first time we've seen it used. We've seen it with Tamar and Judah. We've seen it um, also with Ruth and Boaz. We know also that um, in, in uh, Luke's genealogy, there's five, four women that are listed. The other one is um, we have Rahab. And we, we remember Rahab, she was a, a prostitute who was taken in by Israel. And then we also have Bathsheba in there as well. All women who have had um, different men and two of them leave it marriages to continue this line. So... It makes you think, could this be what's happening here? I'm not saying this is definitive. I'm open to be flexible on this, but I wanted to present you this of what we're reading in the Torah portion is seen in the Messianic line because that can't be reconciled. How can a man have two dads? <laughs> you know, unless there's something going on there legally. So um, we read in Deuteronomy that this was done to the man, um, or we see in a negative sense here, who will not maintain his brother's line. But in this sense, we read that Jacob maintained his brother's line, Eli's line. Um, whether you agree with the attempt to harmonize the two genealogies in this fashion or not, I think we can all agree that Yeshua is adopted by uh, Joseph.